Hi, I'm Mike Martindale, pastor here at the Heights Fellowship. We are so glad that you guys have joined us today. We know that online isn't a replacement for the real thing, but we hope that as you listen to this message that the Spirit of God would still move in your life. Thank you for listening. Woo, that was good. That was good. Man, we love you guys. Thank you so much for leading us and blessing us. Well, guys, I want to go ahead and jump on in today. We are... um, I mean, as I mentioned, out of Jonah 3. Now, if you're new to the Bible and, and it's kind of unfamiliar with you, Jonah is really easy to find. All you got to do is find Obadiah and you'll be right by Jonah, right? Obadiah is really hard to find, just in case you know. It's in your Old Testament about three quarters of the way uh, through your Old Testament, 80% through, something like that, your Old Testament. You should be able to find it. If not, we'll have it up on screen. But this morning, I want to start in the New Testament. Here's the deal. Jonah 3 records the single greatest moving of God in human history. God did more in a shorter time in Nineveh than he has ever evidenced at any other time as far as reaching people with the message of truth and hope, the message of the gospel. It says that that the people of Nineveh believed God and they responded to him. Well, Jesus over in Luke chapter 11 makes a reference to something called the sign of Jonah. He makes it several places. Here's kind of the background. He's in a a pretty heated argument with the religious leaders. And they're saying, oh yeah, if you are who you are, if you are Messiah, we want a sign. Show us something so that we'll believe. Come on, come on, give me something, Jesus. It's not like they haven't seen healings, they hadn't seen miracles, they hadn't heard teaching, they hadn't evidenced things, they had even seen resurrections. And they're asking for one other, and Jesus at this point says, listen, this is a wicked generation. You want a miraculous sign? Well, I'm not going to give you one, except this one, the sign of Jonah. And it tells us over in the Matthew account that Jesus said, As Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. And when you see him raise, just like Jonah was resurrected, that's going to be your sign. Like Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites. Now remember that. So the Son of Man will be to this generation. And there's at least two things. It's not really complicated. Here's what it is. The sign of Jonah is simply this, that someone entombed under the judgment of sin can rise again. Jonah, judged by God, thrown into the ocean by the sailors, saved by the fish, rose from the belly of the beast to resume a great ministry and the greatest single moving of God the world has ever seen. Jesus, condemned at the hands of men, crucified on a borrowed cross by a Roman soldier, put in a borrowed tomb, rose from the grave to change us all. And so the sign of Noah, or the sign of Noah, the sign of Jonah, is simply that someone entombed under the judgment of sin can rise again. It's that promise. And secondly, that God will bring his glory from the ashes of tragedy. And so with that in mind, we want to jump back in to Jonah. And I'm going to pick up at the end of Jonah chapter 2 and read, and it's just 10 10 verses long. We'll read through part of Jonah 3. We'll eventually finish it all, all right? You guys good? You ready? It's a good ride, man. Get ready today. This is is big time stuff. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up on the dry land. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, remember that, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. We'll talk about that here in a minute. It was three days walk, not from where Jonah was, but around it. Right, we'll talk about that. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they called a great fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. 
There's a principle here as we launch out this morning. Jonah, who is, in essence, resurrected from this fish, resurrected from the belly of the beast, goes to them. And here's the principle. That resurrection should always propel us to mission. See, resurrection is not just an, an something I angle for at the end of my life. That's the way we in Christianity treat it a lot of times. I know that when I die, that at some point the Lord is going to come back and He is going to raise my body and He's going to join it to my spirit and my body will be changed into an eternal body so my eternal spirit will have an eternal body to enjoy an eternity with God. That's the hope of the resurrection. And we treat it as end of life stuff. But folks, if you're angling for resurrection impacting your life after you die, you're missing the greatest blessing of it in the here and now. Because it should fuel you for life present. I want you to think about just this simple concept. If I know that I'm going to be raised up, even if you kill me, I'm going to be raised up. What's to stop you? That's what the early church got. Resurrection, yeah, it has a future tense, but it has present power. And I pray that this morning you would be swept up into this idea that the resurrection fuels you for life in the present. That it it should fuel you for everything you say and everything you do. It's a game changer for believers. Because the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the scripture says, is at work in you. Amen? And so let's kind of explore that. Here's what that means, that the resurrection resurrection power of God works in you. First of all, it means that God repurposes our lives. Look at verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, what? A second time. Jonah is a miserable failure. Do you realize that? In this new cycle, in this, in this culture, in this climate that we live in, Jonah would have been old news. He would have been done. I mean, Jonah got the call to go to the big leagues, and he failed miserably. He ran the other direction. He, God said, Jonah, step up, and Jonah stepped back. Jonah's a failure in his vocation. He's a failure in that which all of his life he had trained and participated to become. And the call came and he missed the call. So he's a failure. And Jonah could have used that at this point to look at God and say, Lord, nobody will listen to me. Who's going to listen to a, a disobedient prophet? God, you know my heart, and you know, in in all honesty, at the the base of who I am, I'm racist. Who's going to listen to a racist prophet? God, I failed. I'm guilty. He had confessed that in the belly of the beast. And God didn't just vomit him out on dry land for him to go off and do some lesser thing. God put before him greatness. Folks, it works the same way for us. You see, God doesn't use our failures as a chance or a reason to exclude us. This morning, some of you guys, you would characterize yourself as saying, listen, I failed. I mean, I, my business failed. And my relationships fail. And I, I've, not, I've not been what I've been. I, God, I, I mean, Mike, I, I've, I've, I've had failed relationships. I've had, I have addictions. Mike, I can't live a clean life. Mike, I've done time. I've got a record. My, I, everything that I touch financially, I'm a failure. And you're using that as an excuse to exclude yourself. Well, God doesn't use it as an excuse to exclude you. He didn't do it with, Don, with Jonah. He looks at Jonah and said, listen, Nineveh's still out there. I'm taking you to Nineveh. That didn't end in the fish. That goes on now. I still want you to be the voice. And here's the cool thing. God uses Jonah's failures to fuel his testimony. 
Resurrection means that God repurposes your life. And he used that to fuel Jonah's message and Jonah's testimony. Let me just give you a picture of this. You want it? You want a picture of this? Let me give you a great picture of this. One of the two main deities at the time, one of the two main gods of Nineveh, was a god by the name of Dagon. Now, in Texas, we pronounce it Dagon. You may pronounce it some other way. It's hard not to say Dagon, you know? But this is one of the two main deities. If you've read the Old Testament, you're familiar with this God. This is the God whose temple in Philistia that Samson was in when he was killed. The Philistines worshipped Dagon. He's not exclusive to the Ninevites, but he is one of the main gods. Here's who he is. Dagon is the god of fertility. He's the god, the source of everything. He's associated with water in the sense that life sprang from the water. By the way, the worship of Dagon basically entailed what we would call evolutionary principles. That life emerged from a primordial soup, okay? Just so you know that. And they worshipped this God. It was a particularly savage kind of, uh, of, of idolatry that they were in. He, by the way, had a female counterpart. Her name was Nanshi. Now, do you want to know what Dagon looked like? You want to know what the, the representations of Dagon are? God, th- this is going to blow you away. Now, remember, the context, the reason I'm telling you this is that God doesn't use your failure to exclude you. He uses your failures to fuel your testimony. You know what Dagon looked like? You ready for this? He was the fish god. He was half man, half fish. We get our picture of mermaids and mermen from this god. Nanshi would have been a mermaid. Um, and, and Dagon would have been a merman. See, you thought it came from Little Mermaid. It actually comes from the Bible. But it comes from the worship of this God. Now imagine this. All of a sudden, this dude comes to you and the reputation, his street cred is that he has been swallowed by a fish and lived for three days in the belly of the beast and has been vomited back out and he's here to talk to us. If you're a Ninevite, are you going to listen? Oh, heavens yes. You're going to listen. Here's the point, y'all. God could have used anything to deliver Jonah, couldn't he? He could have sent a snake. He could have sent a raft. He could have sent an airplane. They'd have gone, what's that? I don't know, but it flies. He could have done, he could have sent a spaceship. He could have sent anything, another ship. He could have sent, you know, moss that somehow supported him. And yet God chose a fish. Jonah 1.17 says, God appointed. The Hebrew word for appointed literally means to prepare, subscribe, or enroll. In other words, God went out and got this fish to do his work. You know what that tells me? That what happens in our lives, even with our failures, is not fate. It's not destiny. It's providence. It's the hand of God active and in the lives of his creation, doing and bringing about his purpose. That's why Paul would write that, listen, all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That's providence working. And God used Jonah's failure, swallowed by a fish, eaten by a fish, to fuel The message that he was going to bring them. Did Jonah have an automatic end with the people of Nineveh? Absolutely. And God had prepared it that way. Isn't that cool? I thought it was cool. I was was babbling about this for 20 minutes at lunch on Thursday trying to tell my wife about this. She's like, can we eat now? Okay, we can eat. But the point is, this failure of a prophet. Once he put his failure in the hands of God, once you put whatever your failure is in the hands of God, 
God uses that to fuel your message to the people that he sent you. So you think about what that is in your life. And understand that he has given you ministry that will emerge from that. It's no different from other people in Scripture. Jacob, over in the book of Genesis, he was a fraud, man. He had defrauded his family. And now he's on the run because they're, they're going to kill him. In the midst of his flight, in the midst of him being on the lamb, God comes to him and literally rebirths him into a new guy. He's changed after an encounter with God. Moses was a murderer on the run from the Egyptians. God spends 40 years in the desert resurrecting his life and his vocation and turns him into the greatest prophet that they knew, but that Israel ever knew before Christ. Peter, who, who betrayed, G, or who, who uh, denied Jesus, who was a complete failure in everything that he claimed to be, was restored by Jesus around a fish breakfast at the Galilee one day. Saul, or Paul, was redirected at Damascus. Stephanus, a guy you may not even know his name, he was a jailer in Philippi who was ready to commit suicide because his life had fallen apart due to circumstances beyond his control. He's recommissioned by Paul and Silas. John Mark, who was a failure, he ran home to mommy when things got tough. And under the mentorship of Barnabas, the Lord used that to kind of reclaim him. Apollos. A great speaker, bad theology, was kind of rearranged by Aquila and Priscilla and became one of the greatest speakers in the New Testament, one of the greatest heralds of the gospel in the New Testament. And then there's Onesimus, a runaway slave, whose name means useful, but his life was useless because he was a failure. And he runs into Paul in a Roman prison. And God uses Paul to make his life useful again. Once you put your failure in the hand of God, God will use that to fuel with resurrection power the mission that he gives you to live. So God repurposes lives. Incidentally, it's the same with us. Whatever your failure is, God has taken that and he says, listen, I've forgiven it. I've wiped the slate clean. You may bear the marks from it, but you know what? I'm sending you. And I'm going to send you where I want to send you. The days of comfort are over. The, the days of, of lollygagging around and, and just enjoying the, the safety and security of who you are and where you are, those days are gone. I'm sending you to Nineveh. I'm sending you where I'm going to send you. And it may not be somewhere that you're really happy about going. But he says in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The repurposing always results in ascending. Second thing is this. Resurrection simply means this, that God redirects our path to resume his pursuit. You're to help God as he chases who he's chasing. Pursuing who he's pursuing. And God was pursuing the Ninevites. It says that he sent Jonah and he said, proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh and it's described as a great city. And he did according to the word of the Lord. He was three days walk around. Let, let's talk about the two calls of Jonah for a second. And Jonah 1, 2, I'll put them up on the screen so you can see them both together. In Jonah 1, 2, the Lord says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. This, this call is really rooted in the Jewishness, in the, the Israelite background of Jonah. Jonah was offended by the Ninevites. We'll talk about who they were here in just a minute. He was offended by their lives and their idolatry and their wickedness and their savagery and their treachery. He was offended by them. But look at the subtle difference in chapter 3, verse 2. No longer does he say, go cry against their wickedness. God just says, go say to them what I tell you to say to them. You know why God does that? Because he changed Jonah and the fish. 
Jonah is no longer able to look down on these wicked, evil, fallen Ninevites because Jonah has realized I'm wicked, evil, and fallen just like them. And so God says, go to them as one of them and speak whatever I'm going to proclaim to you. Listen, when God has resurrected you, when God has had that transformation in you, you no longer look down on people because you realize, like Paul said, I'm the greatest of sinners. And I speak peer to peer, not looking down my nose at you. And whatever the Lord tells me to say, I'll say. The person who has authority over you has your unreserved yes, do they not? Jonah realizes God has authority over my life. And so I'll go. Now, let's talk a little bit about Nineveh. There's a box on your notes that kind of bullets these. There was too many to try to get you to fill in blanks, so I just gave them to you. Nineveh could be correlated present day to ISIS. And Nineveh was a place, ISIS is a movement, I get that. But you know where the stronghold of the ISIS movement is right now? The city of Mosul in Iraq. Do you know what's right across the river from Mosul? Nineveh. That's where it was. Nothing's changed, y'all. And, and our feeling about ISIS is about the same as the Israelite feeling toward Nineveh and toward the Assyrians. It was the capital city of the Assyrian Empire, which was a couple of hundred years old at this point. The Ninevites... They were arrogant, man. They lived large. They had the best of everything. They had a thriving economy. They had the greatest of the greatest of technology and money and commerce and all of those things. It was a big, big place. Check this out. History tells us that the city of Nineveh was built over the course of eight years by 14 million workers. Most of them were slaves that had been pulled in from the nations they had conquered. And for eight years, with slave labor, they built this incredible city. It says that it's three days walk. That means it's three days walk to get around Nineveh. Just to give you some perspective, the 289 here in Lubbock, Loop 289, is 26 miles around. So expand it out over two times the size of the Loop in Lubbock, and you get the idea of the size of Nineveh. It was a megalopolis. What that means is it wasn't just a single city. As they grew, they kind of incorporated the cities around them. There were at least four cities that we know of that were a part of larger Nineveh. But Nineveh was the place is what it was called. So it was huge. In that day and age, 800 years before Christ, it was huge. The walls around the city were 100 feet high. They were so broad, and the Ninevites actually did this. They would race chariots from one tower to another, three abreast. They they had three lanes of chariots on top of a 100-foot wall. It's how they moved troops and armaments and fortifications when they were being attacked. So it was a highly secure city. It had towers interspersed throughout the the circumference of the city that were 200 feet high. The population is estimated to be somewhere at the time of Jonah between 600,000 and 2 million people. We're talking a big place even by present standards. It's a big place in the ancient world. The most impressive city of its time. The people who lived there like Isis were amazingly warlike. They were famous and notorious for their savagery and their treachery. If they took your country, they took your city, they conquered your nation, the things they did to you were unspeakable. And so the nations around them hated them. Israel hated them. Nineveh was the last place you would want to go. And incidentally, it was probably the last place that you would ever expect the gospel to take root. We would characterize and call them an impossible to reach people. Now let me ask you a question. There are people in your life, are there not, that you would look at them and say, man, they're impossible to reach, Mike. Man, they, they're articulate, they're strong, they're secure, they know what they believe, they know why they believe, they can articulate that. They're just impossible to reach, right? This was Nineveh. And you had those people in your life. Well, the Bible has a word for us. In Romans chapter 5, Paul wrote it this way. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die while we were still sinners. 
And since we've been made, made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's judgment. For since we were restored to friendship with God by the death of his son, while we were still his, finish it, enemies. While you were impossible to reach, Christ reached you. There was a time when you were Nineveh. There was a time when you were in the belly of the beast. God reached you. And then see how resurrection power works? And so we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. By his resurrected life. Resurrection redirects us. What was God's pursuit of the Ninevites all about? Because they were impossible to reach. And yet God passionately loved them. Just like he passionately loved you. He looks at Jonah and says, listen, they have a need. They're impossible to reach. I'm sending you to reach them. I will reach them. But you got to go. They had a name. Jonah, the name is Nineveh. And God put that in his mind and put that in his heart. And he said, listen, not the depth of sea, not a storm on the sea, not your disobedience is going to stop the fact that they have a name. And that name cries out to me and I long to reach them. And Jonah, they have a neighborhood and you got to go there. So they had a need, they had a name, they had a neighborhood. I want, you, I want you to think about something this morning. You know people that the Lord has put in your mind and placed on your heart that he intends for you to reach. And here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray. Okay, we're going to stop what we're doing, take a time out, and we're going to pray, all right? And you're going to ask God, God, I need you to give me a name or names. I want you to give me, I want you to give me three people, God, by name that need you. Three people that, that somehow are in my traffic pattern. And you're going to show me and talk to me about where to go and how to find them. Are you ready to do that? Okay, let's pray. Bow your heads, let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we pray for this to happen. Just like Jonah and you, you presented this people of need named Nineveh, and you directed him to their neighborhood. Father, in our lives, there are people that have needs. Lord, the days of comfort are over for the church in America. Lord, we have failed miserably being comfortable. It's time to live victoriously being your agent, being the ones that you send. So, Father, I pray for us right now in this room, for every person, that you would give them the name of three people that don't know Jesus. Three people who have the need of salvation. Three people who may be impossible to reach. But Lord, give us their names. And then Father, I pray that you would direct us to their neighborhoods. Father, individually. Or as a family. Or as a life group. Or as a church. That you would direct us there, Lord. We pray for your moving. Lord, we believe that you speak to your people. And we come to you and we, and we appeal to you as your children, Lord, to speak to us. We're serious about this. Amen. Let me ask you a question. When you ask God for a name or names, did God give you a name just to show hands? Let me see them. Let me see them. Holy cow, look around the room. Guys, you got some work to do. Jonah, you got, you got to go to Nineveh. Some of you guys, God is about to change your life forever. Nothing's going to be the same after this morning because of what you just prayed. If you're going to be obedient to the Lord and you're going to follow him. Guys, I'm telling you, the days of comfort are over. The days of sitting back and letting paid staff do it. The days of sitting back and letting some other church do it or are done. This is us. This is now. Do you know the need? Do you know the name? And where is the neighborhood? God redirected Jonah. Jesus' resurrection means that God is redirecting you and your life from you fill in your blank. To resume his pursuit of, you fill in the blank. Who is it? Where is it? What is he calling you to do? A third thing. Resurrection means that God refocuses the message of your life. This is really pretty easy. God looks at Jonah and he says, listen. 
Go and proclaim to them the proclamation that I am going to tell you. So Jonah went. And here was his message. Look in verse 4. He goes into the city a day's walk. He walks into the interior. He basically goes about halfway through. And he cries out and says, here it is. Here is the message that prompts the greatest movement of God among people at one time and one place ever. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's it. Seriously, that reached them? So when they've been prepared by God, all you got to do is do what God tells you to do and say what God tells you to say. I want you to see his method, first of all. He walked into the city. He didn't just go into the city and get an apartment in inner city Nineveh and just purpose to exemplify the, the saved life, the gospel, in front of the Ninevites. It wasn't just about image and living it, living it out. It was about articulating it as well. He immersed himself among the Ninevites. He went into among the Ninevites. He wasn't doing it from the outside sending text. He didn't have a media ministry, and he was projecting it and broadcasting it. He personally went into Nineveh. you got to be willing to go. And he immersed himself in Nineveh, and he articulated the whole time this message of God, and it created the greatest sweeping movement of God the world has still ever seen. And the message was simply what God told him to say. It wasn't Jonah's message. It was God's message. And I want you to notice also that the message was not exclusively centered on grace, love, and mercy. I'm not saying those things aren't important, but if you read what Jonah said, it was predominantly judgment. Think about that. These guys, to get that the news was good, needed to know that there was bad news. Here's what Jonah tells them in a nutshell. He says, guys... There is a God, and you're going, wait a minute, how, where does he say that? Well, we know he must have said it as part of his message, because in verse 8, they respond with, who knows, maybe God will relent. So they know he's talking about a God, this guy who's been spit out of a fish, is telling them, listen, it's not Dagon I'm talking about, it's the God who created the fish. And he is holy and he has been offended by your sin. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will perish. And you must turn. You're on the clock. 40 days. And he must have told them somehow that God would forgive. Because they refer to it. Maybe if we repent and turn that he will relent. He will forgive us. And in chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah even goes ahead and says, God, I knew that if I told him that you would do what you do because you're a God of compassion. And so this was basically the message. Pretty simple, isn't it? By the way, what's our message? Hadn't changed. There is a God. If you're here this morning and you're wondering, okay, what do I have to do to be saved? What, what is the gospel? Here it is. There is a God. He created everything. He is a holy God. He is completely without sin. And he has been offended by your sin. And you may say, well, you know what? I'm trying to be good. I get that, but goodness is not holiness. And he demands holiness. He says in 1 Peter 1, 16, you shall be holy for I am holy. He says in Romans chapter 3, there is none righteous, no, not one. And he says that the wages of that sin is that it severs our relationship, our eternal relationship with him. And the Bible calls that death. And you are separated him from him because of your sin. And you're on the clock because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. And while you were his enemy, God reconciled you to him through Jesus Christ. The work of Christ on the cross was enough to satisfy the wrath of God, to pay the penalty for sin, to remove you from your guilt and to give you eternal life. If you will turn your life over to him, if you will trust him. Message is the same, y'all. And then this. Jonah's just the messenger, not the author. You have to make up anything. 
Paul wrote this. He said, brothers, when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided I would speak only of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. I came to you in weakness and trembling. And my preaching was very plain and with not a lot of oratory and human wisdom. But the Holy Spirit's power was in my words, proving to those who heard, heard them that this was the message, that, that it was from God. And I did this because I wanted your faith to stand firmly upon God and not upon man's great ideas. Isn't it good to know that you don't have to be this master orator? That you don't have to have all the right words. That all you got to do is tell the message God gives you to tell. You don't have to make stuff up. You just got to do it. And you can be plain. You can be benign. You can be, you can be very, very just generic. God will do great things. 1997. 10th anniversary for Mike and Linnell. Mike and Linnell go to San Antonio. My favorite place to go in Texas. We went and saw the Alamo, which is like a shrine to me. We're, we're, at, the, we're at San Antonio, and, and we go down on the river walk, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know anybody. Nobody knows I'm here. I can get away. I don't have to answer anybody. I can do whatever I want to do. We walk out of Hard Rock Cafe, and I hear 40 people in a boat on the river start screaming my name. Mike, 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 Mike. And I'm like, holy cow, who is this? It was Jason Bishop and his entire youth group from Smithville. And they pull the boat over and get out and we talk and hug and talk for a long time. And I looked at Linnell and said, man, I couldn't get away with anything in Texas if I wanted to. We kind of laughed and said goodbye to them. And we go back to the hotel. We walk in the hotel and in the lobby of the hotel is every Sunday school teacher I had as a child. I am not lying. A group of 150 senior citizens from First Baptist Church in Amarillo, Texas are in San Antonio in my hotel. It's like having 150 grandmommies at your anniversary. It's terrifying. And I'm like, hi, why are you here? And they were like, oh, we're here for the Billy Graham crusade. And I was like, well, why not? And you're going with us. Of course I am. And we go to the Alamo Dome to the Billy Graham crusade. And we sit in their section. And God did something to me. And I speak to my shame right now. Because you see, I was a chairman of a big event we did here in the South Plains called Hot Hearts for 16 years. We ran six to 7,000 students at that thing. And we saw hundreds and thousands of students saved. And I'm pretty good at this big event thing. And I'm watching this Billy Graham crusade unfold. And I'm going, what's the big deal? And then he got up to speak. And I literally, to my shame, am watching this going, oh, my soul. I hope the lost people who are here are not offended. Because this is just blah. It's like burnt toast. And then something happened. They gave the invitation. And I watched the floor of the Alamo Dome fill up with people, literally per, just shoulder to shoulder, packed under the floor of the Alamo Dome. And I understand how these events work. I understand about a third of those people probably were counselors and people there to help people. But two-thirds of them were responding to the gospel. I began to weep. God convicted me and said, Who are you to speak for me? I did more with one simple sermon and one plain message than you've done in your whole life on one night. God broke my heart. And I learned a lesson as he redirected and refocused the message. Just share the truth. Last week, I was asked to speak at a big event up, in, up north of here. And I was excited about it. And I prepped really hard and prayed through it and wrote and rewrote the message. Felt really good about what I had. And if, you've done, if you speak for a living, you've probably been here in your life. I get there and it just didn't go well. 
I'm standing there in front of a couple of hundred students speaking and just got this great message, and they're just not responding. It's bad. And I'm, I'm looking at my notes, and I'm looking at them, and they're just, and I'm like, God, what, what's going on here? And you know while it's happening, it's bad. But I treated the text right. I, I did right by the text that I used. Presented the gospel clearly. And then we gave the invitation. And God reminded me of this. You're just the messenger. Give the message, dude. The kids start coming forward to be saved. And I know of at least a dozen who were saved at that event. And, and, and then I gave a secondary invitation and nearly the whole place responded to it. And even though in my humanness, in my mind, I'm like, these people are never going to ask me back. This is so terrible. God was like, yeah, but the one night that they came made an eternity of difference in their lives. And that's what it's all about. Jonah, we'll find next week, is ticked off at God because he does this. And yet God does this. He refocuses the message and he gets the response he desires. Just let me finish the story. So they believed God, not Jonah, they believed God. By this simple message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least, it says. It reached the king, and the king laid aside the royal robes robes, and put on the, the garments of mourning over his sin and repentance. And he sat on ashes. And he issued a proclamation, and he said this, Don't let man or beast. Seriously, dude, they didn't feed their animals during this fast. Don't let anybody taste a thing. Don't let him eat or drink. Our lives are on the line because of our sin. And we turn and we repent from that. He said, let everybody be covered with sackcloth. They're covering their animals with sackcloth as a sign of mourning. Let every man call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way. And from the violence which is in his hands. And who knows? And here's the hope. God may turn and relent. And withdraw his burning anger so that we don't perish. And God did what he promised. And when God saw that they had repented. And he saw their trust that he would forgive. And they turned from their wicked way. God relented. Because God always means business, y'all. This morning you need to get that. That God always means business. And he didn't do what he said. Their response was immediately. They didn't delay. It was personal. It was comprehensive across the whole city. 600,000 to 2 million people responded. Even their animals. And you say, what's the point of the animals, dude? Let me tell you what I think that is. Animals were commerce. Animals were economy. It affected the way they do business. Hear that, businessman. The resurrection power of Christ should even affect the way you do business. It was full of humility, it was honest, it was hopeful, and God honored it. Greatest moving known to to man in the history of man. So this morning as we wrap up, let me ask you a question. Jonah's message, Jonah's ministry was fueled by resurrection power. What about you? Here's the question of the morning. Does resurrection fuel you right now? Because I'm going to ask you to respond if it does. And you need to respond differently if it doesn't. Let me ask you, do you have a heart for your people? Do you really have a heart for them? Don't claim to have resurrection power and say you have no heart for your people. For some of you, that means that right now God is saying, listen, you've got to give up your personal preference. God, I would rather do this. Sorry, I'm sending you to do that. Well, God, I had planned on doing this. I get that. Now you're doing this. Go to Nineveh. And rather than isolating and alienating yourself from whoever or whatever it is, God is saying, listen, I want you to immerse yourself in them. Get near. Get close. And then figure out how what you do, whatever it is that you do, whether you're a 
a psychiatrist, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a blue-collar worker, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whether you you know, own business, whatever. Whatever it is that you do, figure out how what you do fits into God's heart for your people. There's a reason that he's put you through the belly of the fish or done whatever he's done. And then you live missionally, not just by being exposed to them, but by telling the gospel. And then there's a second group here in our application. Let me ask you a question. Are you a real believer? We say, well, I'm kind of a believer. Listen, I read this great quote this week. Being an almost believer is as invalid as being almost pregnant. You either are or you're not. Are you or are you not a believer this morning? If you're not a believer, this is a place of grace and hope and mercy. But it's also a place where we tell you you're on the clock. Your sin has offended God. And because of that, like everyone else, you're not exclusive. Like everyone else, you will spend eternity separated from God in hell if you don't turn from your sin and trust Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, who gave his life for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatness of this message in Jonah 3. Father, we thank you that you redirect and that you repurpose and that you refocus to get the results that you want. And Father, I pray that you would draw us in to that great pursuit, to that great work. Lord, you have relentlessly pursued us to this moment. Lord, I pray that we would be about that, that we would be fueled by the resurrection. And Lord, there are some here this morning who need to give their lives to you. Lord, they're an almost believer, but I pray they would be an all-the-way believer. Now, Lord, I pray that you would speak to their heart, and Lord, they would turn from their sin. They would turn from, from trying to pursue their own ways, their own method of salvation, to say that's good enough, to realize that good enough isn't holy, that only holy is holy, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. Father, as you take our sin away and you put the holy life of your Son in us, you make us right. Lord, I pray right now in chairs, online, wherever it is that people are responding to that. So we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We believe in the power of the Word of God. If you made a decision, we would love to hear from you. As well, if you have any questions, let us know at the email listed at the bottom of the screen. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a good day.